Welcome to the subnetting.net video series on how to subnet. This is lesson one, course overview and introduction to IP. This video series contains nine lessons. Lesson one, which is this lesson, is course overview and introduction to IP. Lesson two is on IP address construct. This includes bits and how binary works. Lesson three is on the subnet mask. This also includes shorthand notation. Lesson four is on IP address types. This includes classes, private ranges, and reserved host addresses. Lesson five is on how to create a subnet cheat sheet. A cheat sheet is useful to help you subnet quickly and accurately without having to do too much math in your head. The next three lessons show you how to apply what you've learned. All subnetting questions can be broken down into three main question types, and there's a lesson dedicated to each type. The final lesson is on advanced topics. This includes variable length subnet mask, or VLSM, and route summarization. Once you've completed this course, you'll have a thorough understanding of subnetting concepts. You'll be able to answer all types of subnetting questions. You'll know the proper way to practice and how to increase your speed, and you won't be intimidated by subnetting questions on an exam. In fact, after you're done with this course and with the proper amount of practice, when you take an exam you'll be excited whenever you see a subnetting question because you'll know it's a question you're going to get right. So let's get started. IP stands for Internet Protocol. Notice the P for protocol. A protocol is a set of well-defined rules for something, and in this case that something is the Internet. There are many acronyms in the networking field that end in P. For example, DHCP, FTP, SMTP, TCP, UDP, HTTP. You don't need to know what any of these are right now. Just know that they all end in P, and that P is for protocol. If you're ever in a networking exam and you see an acronym you don't know, if it ends in P, there's a pretty good chance that P is for protocol. That might just help get you on the right track. In order for devices to communicate across networks or over the internet, each device needs to have an IP address. Here's an example of what some IP addresses look like. 1.2.3.4 192.168.235.158 Notice each of these IP addresses has four numbers separated by periods. Each number is called an octet. Oct is for 8, and it's called that because each number is made up of 8 bits. You don't need to know what a bit is right now. Bits are covered in the next lesson. All you need to know for now is that if a number has 8 bits, that means there are 2 to the 8th power different possible values that number can have. 2 to the 8th is 256. Since each number in an IP address can start with 0, the total range of numbers is 0 to 255. That's 256 total numbers. The full range of all possible IP addresses is 0.0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255. Just a quick note, if someone says, what's your IP, they probably mean, what's your IP address? So sometimes IP can refer to the protocol, and other times it can refer to an IP address. You'll have to tell by the context. There are two types of IP addresses in use today, IP version 4 and IP version 6. All of the addresses you've seen so far are IPv4 addresses. There are many differences between IPv4 and IPv6, but one of the main differences is the number of bits. IPv4 addresses have four octets of eight bits. Four times eight is 32. 2 to the 32nd power is over 4 billion. That's the total number of IP addresses you can have with IPv4. Now 4 billion may sound like a lot, but with over 7 billion people on Earth and lots of servers, workstations, laptops, tablets, cell phones, routers, switches, even cars that are on the internet, 
we're running out of IPv4 addresses. With IPv6, there are four times as many bits, or 128, but that's a lot more than four times as many addresses. 2 to the 128th power is astronomically large. It's approximately 3.4 times 10 to the 38th, or 3 with 38 zeros on the end. That number is so big that the Earth will be swallowed up by the Sun before we run out of IPv6 addresses. Here's what an IPv6 address looks like. For this subnetting course, we don't need to know anything more about IPv6. We're going to focus only on IPv4. IPv6 will be covered in the CCNA videos. On most networking exams, if it's unspecified whether you're doing IPv4 or IPv6 addresses, you can just assume that you're working with IPv4. Here's a quick quiz. Which of the following is not a valid IPv4 address? If you need more time, just pause the video. The correct answer is B. Remember that each octet has 8 bits and the valid numbers go from 0 to 255. Since 256 is outside of that range, that IP address is invalid. So now that you know what an IP address is, what do we do with it? An IP address is used to send messages between devices, similarly to how we use postal addresses to send physical mail. Let's use the postal analogy as an example. Suppose you work in an office building. You have a printout of some important information that you need to give to your new coworker, John. Since John is new, you have no idea where his office is, but you do know that he works on your floor somewhere. So you scream out to the entire office. Hey everyone, this is Bob in Office 22. Hey John the new guy, what office are you in? A couple of seconds later you hear, Hey Bob in Office 22, this is John the new guy. I'm in Office 18. Now that you know where John is located, you can bring him the important document. It may seem strange to yell across the office like that, and in fact it would be strange and quite annoying if people actually did. But sometimes computers really do yell out to anyone in earshot, and this is called a broadcast. Note that computers will only send this kind of broadcast if it thinks the intended recipient can hear it. It would be pointless for you to yell out to John if you know he isn't in the same building as you. Now suppose you want to send the document across town. It's too far to walk it over yourself, so you need to use a letter carrier. Even if you don't know where the destination address is, you can trust that if you have the correct name and postal address on the envelope, then the post office will deliver it to the correct place. An IP address works similarly to the postal address example. Each computer or digital device on a network has its own IP address, and when you want to send a message to another device, you just need to know the destination device's IP address. So what exactly is subnetting? In our previous example, when you were in the office building, remember that we said if you wanted to give a message to John who worked on your floor, you could just walk over to his office and give it to him. But if you wanted to send a message across town, then you'd have to mail it. Now let's suppose you have John's address and the address across town written down side by side. Just by looking at them, how would you know that you can deliver a message to the first address by yourself but for the second address you have to mail it. Well, if you see that John works at your company in the same building, then you know you can just simply walk over to him. But for Saul across town, you know that is outside of your building so you have to mail it. This is where subnetting comes into play. Networks can be separated into multiple subnetworks, which are also called subnets for short. When a device wants to send a message somewhere, Subnetting allows the device to know just by looking at the destination IP if it is in the same subnet or not. If the destination IP address is in the same subnet, it sends the message one way, kind of like walking it over, and if the destination IP address is in a different subnet, then it sends the message a different way, kind of like mailing it. 
This will be covered in more detail in the CCNA course, but for now, I'll give you a little teaser and tell you that the second way for a different subnet requires the use of a router to send the message. If you're sending messages to inside your own subnet, then you don't need a router. We'll get into subnetting and subnets in more detail in Lesson 3. This is the end of Lesson 1, which was a course overview and introduction to IP.